let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer. During that time, we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins that ensure the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our God. We thank you for your faithfulness and for your dynamic and living word. We thank you that we can come together as the royal family and study your word, focus on it, and be prepared for whatever comes next. We also thank you for these who have come, who are hungry, We pray that you will help us to concentrate as we drink in your your word in full measure. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue with the major Bible events. We're actually still in Genesis. I don't know when we'll get out of Genesis or even if we will. But we're in chapter 16 and we ended last Sunday in chapter 16, verse 15. So you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 16, verse 15. So Hagar bore Abram a son... And Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Now you would think that's somewhat of a innocuous verse. Uh, probably not too much to say about it. I had seven points on it. <clears throat> and we spent some time going there. And one of the things that we ended on was... Falling on your face. This was connected with, we know that we have a God who hears. And Ishmael name, Ishmael's name mean God hears. And we all need to remember that. And from time to time there are things that come into our lives that may be a crisis. It's something that we don't know what to do, how to handle it. And so we were focusing on a phrase that's used 45 times in the New American Standard Bible, and that is to fall on your face. I gave you examples of just a few. Well, Moses fell on his face when during the Korah Rebellion, and it could have ended his life. And then we had Joshua falling on his face when he came face to face with Jesus Christ, the Lord of the armies. Even Jesus himself fell on his face in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then we covered a man who was a leper. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, will you make me clean? So we pick up that same expression this morning. Falling on your face is the ultimate expression of humility. People have asked me before, what do you think you'll do when you see Jesus Christ? And I I didn't know at that time when they asked me the question that it was used 45 times in the Bible or even that it was the ultimate expression of humility. But I thought then, and I still think now, I would just fall on my face as the ultimate expression of humility, vulnerability. There were hardened Roman soldiers who saw the angel who rolled away the stone and they fell down on their face. So that's what we were going through. And I thought I would add one more thing that I found since then. I think it's humorous because there were a lot of people who fell on their face 
But in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, we have a, an idol who falls on its face. It was, the name of it was Dagon. What happened is that the Philistines had uh, stolen the Ark of the Covenant, and they thought they were big stuff for doing that, and they took the Ark into uh, the place where uh, Dagon, the, their idol was. It was a fish god. And I'll read a little quote here. This is from uh, Heavenly Laughter, Bibliotheca Sacra, uh, number 95 on page 280, uh, 208. It says, In the presence of God's ark, Dagon, even on his own premises, fell on his face. In other words, they, they took the ark and they brought it in there. And here you have Dagon. Here you have the ark of the covenant, which... Uh, represents not only salvation but Jesus Christ and they left it and the next morning they came and it fell on its face literally and and broke some arms off and everything and so they set it up again and once more it fell and this time when it fell on its face there was nothing but a stump left just a it was just <laughs> I think that's funny So it was so mutilated that only a stump was left, and that's in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. So uh, there is a sense, of, God has a sense of humor. Uh, I don't think the Philippians, I mean, excuse me, the Philistines appreciated it. And by the way, it was causing so much chaos that they decided to give it back to the Israelites, which they did. In connection with falling on your face and knowing that God hears. There's another quote I have here from George Van Pelt, Rushing Ahead of God, and this is an exposition of Genesis chapter 16, Bibliotheca Sacra, 163 on page 291. Bibliotheca Sacra is a journal. It's been, they have hundreds of them. I think it's about... I don't know how many hundreds of years old it is, and they just keep putting more and more journals up as, as time passes. But this one says, The psalmist, referring to David, voiced the same conviction Abram learned here when he wrote, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. So again, this is connected to God hearing, just as uh, it was a, a lesson and a reminder that God told Abram and Sarai to name their yet unborn son that would be born Isaac, which means uh, God hears. We need to remember that God hears. Sometimes things come into our life and we don't know what to do. And we talk to our friends, we talk to family members, we talk to everybody but God, and that's who we need to talk to first because he hears. And so the psalmist, of course, in this case it was David, voiced the same conviction Abram learned when he wrote, Out of the depths I cried, I cried to you, O Lord. And listen to this, last, this next phrase. I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. That is very important. I'm going to read it again. So when something happens, and we don't know what to do. And many times we're frightened. And we have to acknowledge that because that's a sin. It's just it's simply not trusting the Lord. I wait for the Lord. How do you express faith in God when a calamity occurs? You do it by simply waiting. You don't go out and connive and scheme and try to do things. You go to him first because he hears and you fall on, your, fall on your face. When it says, I cry out to the Lord, that is similar to falling on your face. You're completely vulnerable. You're completely humble. And you're, you're just pouring out your soul to God. He hears that. And then he says, during the waiting process, I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait and in his word do I hope. That's where during the waiting process we 
are able to be strengthened is through his word. And in fact, Psalms 130, that was a, a quote from Psalm 130, and Psalm 31 through 6 addresses this. David uh, exhorted God's people this way, wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. That's Psalm 37, 34. Now that was verse 15. Now we go to verse 16. We're in Genesis 16, 16. It's the last verse of chapter 16. And then we're going to go to something that is related. So Genesis 16:16 16, 16 says Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So this is a time marker. Abram had to wait 11 years from the time that he was called from Ur the Chaldees to the time Ishmael would be born. But his waiting was still not over. It was going to be 14 more years before the promised son, Isaac, would be born. <clears throat> it would make him 100. Now, the lessons of Genesis 16 is this. God is always faithful and his way is always the, always the best way. Sounds simple, but it is profound. We need to remember that. God is always faithful and his way is always the best way. So why should we try other ways? It's easier to wait when you're in fellowship, when you're trusting the Lord. It's easier to wait than go out there and try to solve the problem yourself. And when you try to solve the problem yourself, what happens? Does it get better or worse? Always gets worse. We need we <clears throat> excuse me. We simply need to relax and wait on our omnipotent God to do what to us is impossible. For m most people, when it seems like there is no solution, it's just impossible. That's when God is most evident. And our job is to wait. Wait on our God. And during that time we can relax. There's no, if you're trusting the Lord and you're strengthening yourself through, do, uh, with the Word while you're waiting, it's much easier than getting into deeper and deeper into a quicksand of stupidity by trying to handle it ourselves. Okay, now we're going to, that's the end of chapter 16. Now we're going to fast forward to Genesis chapter 21. So I want everyone to go to Genesis chapter 21. The reason we're going there is because it relates to what we just saw in chapter 16. And if you don't have a Bible or if you like, you can see it up here as well. Genesis chapter 21. Genesis 21.1 Then the Lord took note of Sarah. See, by this time her name had changed from Sarai to Sarah. We'll get that in the next chapter. And he said, And the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Now, to put this in context, the year before Sarah was going to bear Isaac, the promised child, the promised one. He came to them, the Lord came to them and said, next year you're going to bear, bear that son. That was 13 years after what we saw in chapter 16. And it would be one year later from when he visited them and told them that this is recorded. So this is showing the faithfulness of God here. So, and the Lord 
did for Sarah as he had promised. Verse 2, so Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham. His name had changed from Abram to Abraham. That's in chapter 17. And Abram called the name of his... Oh, but I left the part out. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. So again, it's showing God's faithfulness. Verse 3. And Abram, Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. That's nailing it down. So there's no question about how this son came to be. Verse 4. Then Abram, Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old. By the way, have y'all noticed that I'm adding a question to your bulletin? I've done, I think this is about the fifth time I do it. I'm going to continue to do it to ask, ask you a question. And this answers today's question because I asked, uh, when were, uh, Jewish male baby circumcised and it tells us the eight days and they say it's, it's, it takes eight days until the, the body is able to coagulate the blood and so forth so that was the answer to the question and God had had, had commanded them That's, that all takes place in chapter 17 we're going to go back to chapter 17 but as we go through this chapter 21 you're going to see how it relates to everything that we have been looking at with Abram and Sarai. Verse 5. Now Abram was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me, for everyone who hears will laugh with me. We went over this in detail. I think it was last Sunday, but I'll reiterate it again. It it's really has a lot of uh, meaning when he, when she said, God has made laughter, that is Isaac's name. So in one sense, she's saying, God has made Isaac for me. And of course, the name laughter is just the opposite of what happened. In chapter 17, we're going to see that Abram laughed when God, this was the year before, when he came to them and promised that they were going to have a son. Abram laughed within himself. And of course God heard it. And so, and then in the, I, I don't know if it's in 17, that same chapter, it might be the next chapter, that he, when the Lord came to Abraham, Ab, at this time, Abraham and Sarah, and said that he was going to destroy Sodom, this time Sarah laughed. And so, that is a, a, if you could say bad laughter, that was a ridiculing laugh. That was a laugh of unbelief. But here, it's no longer a laugh of unbelief. And this is a great expression of God's love and grace is because now she said God has, has made laughter for me now, God could have held a grudge against her because he was highly insulted when he promised again that they were going to have this son, and she laughed in a ridiculing way. But now, because of his grace, she's laughing in a good way. She's laughing because she is so happy. And so God has made laughter, Isaac, for me, and everyone who hears will laugh with me. They're going to be so happy that you have this woman, I think... Uh, she, uh, Abram was a hundred, and I think Sarah was ninety when she bore this child. And so everybody was happy. Do you see how God can make all things turn out for good? Verse seven. <clears throat> and she said, "Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Remember, she was barren her entire life, and at ninety years old, she starts having uh, uh, having her son nurse." Yet I have borne him a son in his old age, referring to Abraham. The child grew and was weaned, and Abram, Abraham, I'm sorry I keep saying Abram because I've been saying it for about three months. Now it's Abraham, only in chapter 21. 
the child grew and was weaned. Let's see, I got the, and Abram, Abraham <laughs> made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking. So, so this is going to set something that seems very familiar. Now, who was the son of Hagar? Ishmael. And he's probably about 15, 14, 15 years old, somewhere along in that, that age. And here this baby is born, and Sarah sees him mocking. And this this word mocking has a root that sound, that's similar to laughter. Because after all, what do you do sometimes when you mock? <laughs> Don't you do that? You laugh, point, something like that. So uh, again, you have a, a, another take on laughter. And so you have Ishmael is mocking Isaac. And so you can imagine what's going to happen, verse 10. Therefore, she said to Abraham, this is Sarah, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. Does that sound familiar? Now again, we have her commanding her husband to do something. And if, unless you've read this, and if you're reading your Bible, don't read ahead. Just stick with me. This sounds exactly like what happened before. She said, this time she was pregnant with with Ishmael, and she she uh, what what did we have? We had Hagar mocking Sarah, and so they had to leave. And so we see this pattern; it's happening again. Uh, verse eleven: the matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. Ishmael was not the promised son. But he was Abraham's son, and he loved him. He cared about him. And so he, he probably thought, oh, no, here we go again. And the old, the old adage that when mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Uh, that's what we see here. Uh, that uh, she's not happy, and she's going to make everybody miserable. And so, of course, Abraham was upset, Abraham was upset about it. Now, ver verse 12, but look at this. But God, underline that. This is I gave you this in in this series about everything changes when the Bible says "but God," <clears throat> but God is going to step in. But God said to Abraham, "Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named." So Abraham is going to not have to be all in a dither because it looks like history is going to repeat itself. He doesn't have to clash with his wife. He doesn't have to do what every husband should do, which is the right thing, regardless of what anyone else says. He is responsible to God for the well-being of his family. So he doesn't have to consider that because God tells him, this time you listen to her. The first time he was chastised by God for listening to his wife who was given the orders. But this time he says, listen, and the reason is because if Ishmael continued to hang around, there would be conflict because it was Isaac that was going to be the seed to which the promise was made, not to Ishmael, and you know there was going to be trouble, maybe even an assassination attempt. And so to cut it all off, God says, listen to your wife in this case. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 13, And of the son of the maid, referring to Ishmael, I will make a nation also, because he is your descendant. So again, we see God in his grace, and because of his deference to Abraham, it is his child, he says, I'm, I'm not going to just forget about him. He's not going to go out into the desert and die, even though that would appear as to what was going to happen. He's, no, I'm going to make a great nation out of him also, or, or many descendants. Just as Isaac 
was going to have the descendants that were like the sand on the seashore. So he's, he's calming the situation down by giving him this information. Verse 14. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. But putting them on her, by putting them on her shoulder and gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. So here we have the same thing that happened before. She goes out. Previously she was pregnant, but this time she has her son with her. And they have nowhere to go. They're just wandering out in the wilderness. Verse 15, when the water in the skin was used up, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him and about a bow shot away. That means how far you could shoot an arrow. For she said, do not let me see the boy die. Who was she talking to? It was only her and Ishmael there. So she was talking to God. Because at this point she had learned that God hears. And she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. Verse 17. God heard the the lad crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him by the hand, for I will make a great nation of him. So here, because she had learned that God hears her her woes and troubles. She calls out to God, God hears, and now he's going to provide a solution. Verse 19, Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin, the one that uh, Abraham had given her for the water, uh, and she filled it with water and gave the lad to drink. You see, there was a well before, remember, in the first time she left. Here we have the second time she leaves, another well of water. You can make a lot of things about that. Water is a, you have to have water to live and so forth, but we'll press on. Verse 20. God was with the lad, and he grew, and he lived in the wilderness and became an archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So we see here that God provided the Solution. Do you see why I went to chapter 21 to kind of balance out what happened before? Because we have, what, uh, 17, 18, 19, we have four chapters in between here. But this ties into what we saw with Abram and Hagar and Sarai. Okay, now we're going to switch gears completely. We're going to go and find Abraham and Sarah in the New Testament. So you can turn to Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Galatians 4, 21. So it's this time the focus is on Sarah and Hagar in one of the rare instances in the Bible where a scripture is allegorized. And we're going to look about look into this thing about allegorizing the Bible a bit because it's very important not to allegorize it, but in this case, it is allegorized because the text itself says that this is an allegory. I don't want you to start reading there yet. I want you to just go there because we have some things to address first. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a definition of allegorizing from this book. This is Basic Bible Interpretation by Roy B. Zuck. And he says on page 29, and this is a quote, allegorizing is searching for a hidden or secret meaning underlying but remote from and unrelated 
in reality to the more obvious meaning of a text. Now, this is the hard definition. I'm going to give you a lot simpler one. But just follow this. Don't, if, don't, I wouldn't take notes of this because it's, it's kind of long and somewhat... Uh, it's, it's just harder to, to grasp. So I want you to listen. Don't take notes. Just listen. And then we're going to go to a simpler definition. So he says again, allegorizing is searching for a hidden or secret meaning underlying but remote from and unrelated in reality to the more obvious meaning of a text. In other words, there are people who allegorize the text and when they read a text, they're thinking, okay, th this isn't a literal text. This is a like a code. This is meaning something else, and then they will go outside out of the clear blue, and they say, well, really, this is what this text means. When someone allegorizes, they are not taking the Bible literally, and they bring things into the text. I'm continuing with this definition now. It says, in other words, the literal reading is a sort of code. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll I was going to put, I forgot it was still up there. Well, y'all are reading it along with me. In other words, the literal reading is a sort of code which needs to be deciphered to determine the more significant and hidden meaning. So they say there's, there's more to it than this. It doesn't mean just what it says there. It's, it's got a hidden meaning. And they think that we have to bring out this hidden meaning. Well, where does this hidden, where do they find this hidden meaning? Boop, right out of thin blue sky. Did they just essentially make it up? In this approach, the literal is superficial and the allegorical is the true meaning. I I'll tell you what, what uh, Martin Luther thought of this, this idea of allegorizing from this same book. From, uh, Dr. Such. <clears throat> Luther denounced the allegorical approach to the scriptures in strong words. He says, quote, Allegories are empty speculations and as it were, the scum of Holy Scripture. Origin's allegories are not worth so much dirt. To allegorize is to judge the scripture. Allegorizing may degenerate into a mere monkey game. <laughs> allegorizing, a, a, allegories are awkward, absurd, inventive, obsolete, loose rags. I think he's trying to get a point across. He doesn't believe in allegorizing. Then he goes on to say he... <clears throat> He says the scriptures are to be retained in their simplest meaning ever possible and to be understood in their grammatical and literal sense unless the context plainly forbids. In other words, there are some things that you don't have to question uh, whether it is to be taken literally or whether it is talking about something that is symbolic. He says, Scripture is its own interpreter. This is the true method of interpretation which puts Scriptures alongside of Scripture in a right and proper way. Remember when uh, Daniel was telling Nebuchadnezzar about what his dream meant? He was interpreting the dream. And he would say, he would say what the dream was and then he would give it its interpretation. That is what... In other words, we wouldn't know what the dream meant apart from the scriptures telling us. And that's what happens is when we're not sure about something, it's not allegorized, it's interpreted somewhere else in the scripture. He said allegor allegorizing, this again is uh, in the same book here, allegorizing becomes arbitrary. It has no objective or controls on one's imagination. It obscures true meaning of Scripture. It has no authoritative mes message for one person may say a passage teaches a certain truth allegorically where another may see 
an entirely different teaching. It is a way of wresting the scriptures from having any certain authority. In addition to, and not in place of plain grammatical meaning of the word. So I'm, this is just giving you some information to preface what I have to give you now. We believe in a literal, grammatical, and historical interpretation of Scripture. Again, literal, grammatical, and historical interpretation of the Bible. I'll break each one of those down just quickly. By literal, we mean that we attach to every word the same meaning that it would have in its normal, grammatical, and literal sense unless the context shows it to be obviously symbolic. And to make it even simpler, when the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense, lest you end up with nonsense. That's my favorite definition. Do I want to hear it again? When the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense, lest you end up with nonsense. That's what, it, what we mean by literal. Grammatic, do y'all want to see this? I have this on notes. Do y'all want to see it as we go? Will that be helpful? Okay, I'll do it for this part. So this is what we just had here. The li- interpretation, if we take a a literal, grammatical, historical interpretation of the Bible, and I've given you this. Now let's look at the grammatical. Grammatical means that the original languages of the Scripture are used, paying attention to the rules of grammar to determine the meaning of the words. If you if you read the Bible and you don't know the original languages, then you're going to learn... I want to really emphasize this. A lot of people, of believers, say, well, there's no use in me reading the Bible because I don't know the original language. And I, you know, that's, that's a monkey game. <laughs> As Luther would say. Uh, I thought that was funny. Loose rags. He also said that. We don't want to say, well, we're not going to read the Bible because we don't know the original languages. Well, you don't have to know the original language to benefit greatly from the Bible. I encourage you, I implore you to read your Bible. You should read it every single day. Some, you know, a, a chapter to whatever, whatever you have uh, uh, allocated to time to do that. But read it. But for a person who's going to teach the Bible, and you want to make sure that it's accurate, you have to go to the original languages. Not only do you have to go to the original languages, you have to have a grammatical interpretation. And again, it means that you go to the original languages of the scriptures and you pay attention to the rules of grammar to determine the meaning of the words. And then the third way that we interpret the Bible is historical or isagogic. Isagogics mean you interpret the Bible based on the time in which it was written and to whom it was written. So historical or isagogic approach of the study of the Bible which considers the historic context of the scriptures. And what happens so many times, I mean, so often, especially when somebody's in the Old Testament and is talking about the nation of Israel as a whole, and there will be exe- well, I don't know if they're exegetes. There'll be pastors are teaching, and they'll try to make it relevant to the church age in which we live in the New Testament. But they broke the rule of the historical or isagogical approach because it has to be taken in context of then. What was going on then? What is it talking about for then, not now? Okay, I had you turn to uh, Gen- Gen- uh, Galatians chapter 4. I don't know why I don't have verse 21 on here, but I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, what we're going to do now is 
Do you see down here where I say this is allegorically speaking in red? So let me tell you what we've done. We've gone to the New Testament and we're going to see Hagar and Sarai, or Sarah now, Hagar and Sarah, and the Apostle Paul, right in the Galatians, is going to make a spiritual, a, a spiritual argument, which is an allegory about about what happened then. So I don't have verse twenty-one, but I'll read it here. This is Galatians chapter four and verse twenty-one. Tell me, you who want to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? So what we're seeing here, and starting with Galatians chapter 4 verse 21, is Paul is going to make a comparison between those who wanted to be under the law and those who are under grace. And he's going to use Hagar as a demonstration in an allegorical fashion to represent the law, and he's going to use Sarah as an illustration of one who represents grace. That's what's going to go on here, okay? So I'm going to read these, <clears throat> read these first a few verses, and then we're, we're going to go into it a little more. Verse 22. For it, was, it, was, it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, and you can see up here I put in the bondwoman, who is Hagar, and one by the free woman, which was Sarah. But the son by the bondwoman, which his name was what? Ishmael, was born according to the flesh. Now you can write in your Bible, I hope you do, some of these parenthetical notes, because it'll help you understand. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Now, it can mean two different things here. Or, or it can mean even both. The flesh could mean a normal birth. One that, that is, doesn't have any uh, supernatural aspects to it. It was a normal birth. But it can also mean, and does mean, uh, carnality. What, do, what, does, what is the term that the New Testament uses often to illustrate sin or carnality? It's flesh. And in this case, the son of the bondwoman was, was born... In, because of carnality. Because Abram uh, listened to his wife Sarai and both of them had stopped trusting the Lord and they were going to do this on their own. They were acting independently of God and they decided, we're tired of waiting, we'll just make this happen. So that's carnality. So do you see the two aspects that it means when it says, but the son of the bond woman born according to the flesh. A normal birth, but it was done because of carnality, which also represents flesh. But the son by the bond woman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. And here I have in a supernatural birth. This is, it, you could say, it's, it also I could put here, has something to do with spirituality. Because it was a promise. Put it into the realm of spiritual because it was nothing normal about it. It was super normal. It was supernatural birth. That birth based on the promises of, promise of God. Verse 24. Now, this is where I have it in red. Big time here. This is allegorically speaking. Now, we're going to see that the Bible does not allegorize unless the verse says it is allegorized. It only happens a couple of times in the Bible, and this is one of them, and it has to do with Hagar and Sarai and Abram, so we're, we're dealing with it here. But we're also learning something about interpretation and why a literal, grammatical, and historical gra uh, interpretation is imperative. When you start getting into allegorizing or when you start trying to say, oh, well, this is symbolic, when it's not symbolic, it's literal, then you get out into the weeds uh, according to uh, interpretation. So, in verse 24, Paul is saying, this is allegorically speaking. Now, what he's saying now is, is he's explaining this allegory. For these 
women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now I have a few more notes here about this, the characters here, and about allegorizing, and then we're going to go in into starting in verse 21 again quickly, but looking at it from a different perspective and to, to address it from this allegorical perspective. Are you all with me? Are you following? Okay. Here's a few notes, though, first of all, and these notes come from this book. This is Ever, Re Ever Reforming, and this is by Dr. Andy Woods, a friend of mine, and he's. Uh, it's not a long book. It's only about... Uh, 160 pages, something like that. I recommend it to you. Talking about uh, when the Reformation took place, they did move the ball forward so far, but they didn't complete it, and now we, we, there are those who have to continue the Reformation because it was started by people like Luther. Uh, Luther was uh, uh, a Catholic, and he was uh, still, even though he did a great effort in having people actually look at the scriptures, the, the sola scriptura, uh, scripture only, faith alone, uh, by grace alone, scriptures alone. He came up with all that, but he also hung on to some of his Catholic teachings as uh, pedo-baptism, uh, baptizing babies and such. So, this is the quote I'm having is from Dr. Wood's book. Now, when we are teaching, or reading in the book of Genesis, we take the characters Sarah and Hagar literally. But here in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul uses them to develop a spiritual idea. He's, he's going he's to take these characters and make a spiritual... Uh, he's going to develop something spiritually from their life. Notice, I am not free of my own accord to go through the Bible and assign allegorical interpretation to historical events just as I desire. So when he says this is allegorical, it doesn't mean, oh, well, we can do that too. We can go there and assign anything we want to to it. That's not what this is saying. I may not do this, come up with my own allegor allegorization, unless the text tell me to do so. Paul has done this at the beginning of this verse through his employment of the term allegorically. He wants the words to be used in a figurative sense and thus gives us permission to take them that way. But what we're going to see here is we're not going to do the allegorizing. Paul is. He's not, he's, he's, he doesn't get to this point and say, okay, now we're allegory. What do you think it is? He's telling us what it is because he's trying to make a spiritual concept from what actually happened in reality. So when the Bible gives us such permission, it will also give us the very interpretation of the allegory. I'm not free to interpret the allegory in any way that I want based on my own sanctified Im imagination. I must follow the interpretation that the text gives. So he's allegorizing, and he's going to tell us, this is how I'm allegorizing. This is how what this spiritual concept is. What part do we play in that? Nothing other than reading it and benefiting by it. We don't add anything to it. When we, when we practice literal interpretation from Genesis to Revelation, we are allowing the authority to remain in the text where it belongs. When we deviate from, uh, I think that's supposed to be from, from that and spiritualize things that are not meant to be interpreted spiritually, then the authority over the interpreted process is transformed from the text to the mind of the interpreter. So, and you'll have, you'll have people, you'll run into people who any any time they make something symbolic that's not symbolic, then they start allegorizing. And where is when they do that, then what you're hearing from them is authority that they have given to the text rather than the authority coming from the text. 
And it's always the text. It's always the scriptures themselves that has the authority. The issue is really who is in control. I want, he, and this is Andy saying this, I want to enthrone the word of God as the authority. After all, God gave us his word. Who am I to rewrite uh, rewrite God? Now, I have no idea. I can't tell from your expressions if you all are getting that. Does anybody have any questions about this? Okay. Now, uh, oh, I have, I, have, I have another quote. I forgot about this quote. Galatians chapter 4, verse 22 through 31, juxtaposes the Mosaic law and grace. That was, that's what it's all about. That's what motivated Paul to take these real characters, Hagar and Sarai, and make a spiritual concept from them. And it's phenomenal. And it's all to take, make sure that the people who want to live by the law are foolish because there's grace that offered to them. So this is by, who is it? Oh, this is by John MacArthur, uh, the uh, MacArthur Study Bible, this quote. He says, quote, Paul uses two mothers, their two sons, and two locations as illustrations of two covenants. Hagar, Ishmael, and Mount Sinai is the, and the earthly Jerusalem represent the covenant of law. Sarah, Isaac, and heavenly Jerusalem represent the covenant of promise. The purpose of the Mosaic covenant was to show all who were under its demands and condemnation their desperate need for salvation by grace alone. And he gives uh, Galatians 3.24. But what we're looking at here, what, why did God give the Mosaic law to begin with? Well, it's true that Israel had been in slavery for 400 years. They didn't know anything about how to be a nation. And so it helped them in that fashion. But the main thing, especially the Ten Commandments were given, not only as a moral law, but to demonstrate that mankind cannot keep God's law. And therefore, it would point to a Savior. That's what the Mosaic Law was about. And so, in, this, in these uh, two concepts we're talking about here, uh, Sarah, uh, excuse me, Hagar, Mount Sinai is where the law was given. That's why it's going to talk about Hagar and link her to, uh, to Mount Sinai because that's where the law was given. The law can condemn, but it can't save. It, it shows that you need a Savior because you can't keep the law as hard as you try. And if you, if you fail in one Law. If you disobey one law, what does the Bible say? Then you disobey the whole Mosaic law. So it's pointing to a Savior. But then you have Sarah, Sarai, is a promise because that's all spiritual. The only reason that Abraham and Sarah had a son was because of God's grace. It was a spiritual thing, not a trying to do it yourself type of thing. So, again, the purpose of the Mosaic Covenant was to show all who were under its demands and condemnations their desperate need for salvation by grace alone. It was never intended to portray the way of salvation, and that's what they were doing. Israel had taken the law in Jerusalem, this, as we go through these scriptures in uh, Galatians 4, 21 through 30, we're going to see that the Israelites had taken the Mosaic Law and made it a way to get to to be able to be in the kingdom by by obeying the law. They thought it was by works, and they were saying and it was so impossible because not only did you have the Mosaic Law that God gave in the Bible, but the Israelites added hundreds, thousands of other rules that were man-made, and they said that if you're going to be saved, if you're going to be in the kingdom, then you need to obey all this. So that's why it references the, the Jerusalem in this 
as we go through here, it's going to talk about the city of Jerusalem that existed at that time, and it was saturated with legalism. You have all these Jews who are trying to uh, be saved by the law, as opposed to another Jerusalem, which it says is a heavenly Jerusalem. This is the new Jerusalem that's going to come down out of heaven. We're going to tie all that together and see what Paul is talking about, because it's phenomenal. And not one in 10,000 believers have a clue that this is even in the Bible or its significance. And this is the perfect time for us to go there because when now we know all about Sarah and Abraham and Hagar, and now in the New Testament, Paul just goes into this allegory where he's given a spiritual concept based on these people and it can really solidify in our minds to be able to tell others the difference between those who are trying to be saved by works, by the law, and those who just believe the promise of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the difference. Oh, well, I'm out of time. Um, here, by the way, here I do have, this is where, and next time, well, next Sunday will be Communion Sunday. And Abijit is going to be speaking afterwards. So it will be two weeks from today that I will go into this allegory that Paul is giving. And it's, it's phenomenal. You can read it for yourself if you like. See what you can get out of it. You can, I mean, you can learn from it. But I, I see it, I put in, in parentheses here, uh, things that might be helpful. So this is going to unfold and it's going to be neat because You've learned something today, hopefully, about interpretation. Y'all say this with me. Y'all aren't going to like this. When we're talking about interpretation, we believe in a literal, grammatical, historical interpretation. And most of the time when you're talking to people and they're out there and uh, La La Land, uh, they, they're making outrageous th- statements about the Bible. Most of the time, they've taken something that is literal. The Bible is, there are things in there that are symbolic. There's figures of speech. There's things like that. But we take a literal translation unless the text obviously is not talking about something literal. And then we, and when you're talking about allegorizing, this was perfect. This was a, what do they say, a perfect storm? This was a perfect time for us to go on this right after we finished uh, Hagar and Sarah and Abraham there. Now we're ready to really understand what's going on here. It'll be a lot easier to teach because you're already prepared. And we'll do that in two weeks. I'd like everyone please to uh, bow your head. The reason I want you to bow your head is because Nobody's going to be looking at anybody. This has to be complete objectivity. The good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went to the cross and died for the sins of the world. That includes your sins and my sins. God put our punishment upon Him. And now, God offers eternal life as a gift. It's the only way it's ever offered. And the way that we receive it is simply trusting in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross on our behalf, taking our punishment, rather than trusting in our own works. And when we do that, in that moment of time, when we put our faith alone in Christ alone, we are born again. We're born spiritually. We become a royal family member of the Most High. We have eternal life, so it's impossible for us to lose it, our ticket to heaven is guaranteed, and now the reason that we're left on this earth is for us to grow in grace and knowledge so that we can behave in a way that glorifies God. And we do that by trusting Him, claiming His promises, and then waiting for Him in His time, in His way, to provide the solution. And He gets all the glory and we get the blessing. What a phenomenal plan. We live in a decadent, God-hating, biblical, denying world. And yet, 
there are, there are points of light all over it that are believers, especially believers who are growing in grace and knowledge. Now, Father, we thank you for your phenomenal word. And we pray that you will help us to focus on these things, think about them, employ them, and apply them in our life. We pray this in Jesus' most high and holy name. Thank you.